So now we're going to talk about a topic that has to do with wires, although not directly. It actually has to do with pins. Now, pins are the uh, special connections that the chip uses to con communicate with the outside world. And pins in general are either input pins or output pins. There are I.O. pins, but these are special cases. Uh, the majority of pins are either purely input or purely output. And there are special pins, like pins that drive the clock or pins that drive ground and supply, but we are talking about the general pin here. The problem with pins is that they have to uh, carry out communication between the core of the chip and between the PCB or the printed circuit board upon which the chip is mounted. And the problem here is that the nature of the signal outside the chip is very different from the signal of the nature inside the chip. The signal outside the chip has to have a very high magnitude. It's a very large signal because it travels over a very long copper track over the PCB. So it has to have a high magnitude so that it can travel through this um, long distance without being affected by noise. On the other hand, signals within chips tend to be very different. Signals within chips are uh, small amplitude signals because we use uh, low power supplies and they also tend to be high frequency and there's a lot of them. And so pins have to manage uh, the separation between uh, signals within the chip signals outside the chip and has to have a way to get the signals from in the chip to the outside world and from the outside world into the chip. So I'm going to discuss four specific issues that have to do with uh, what pins have to manage. One is to drive the large uh, off-chip capacitance or large off-chip uh, um, load. This has to do with, uh, with output pins specifically. So this is output. Uh, issue number two uh, is providing electrostatic discharge protection. And this is an issue that has to do specifically with input pins. Uh, it also has to provide level conversion. And level conversion means we have to move between the uh, high levels of the uh, off-chip signals and the low levels of the on-chip signals. And so this has to do with input and with output pins. You know, it has to go both ways. And number four is provide latch up protection, which again is important for all uh, pins, but specifically it is important for supply and ground pins. So I'm going to talk about each of these uh, individually, but first let's look at what a pin actually looks like. So a pin is a um, metal connection. It's like a metal protrusion coming out of the uh, plastic body of the chip. Uh, but in reality, this pin is connected to the core of the chip uh, through a copper wire. And at the, in the core of the chip, if this is the boundary of the chip core, the way that this pin communicates with the core of the chip is through something called a pin pad. And the pin pad is a very large metal area, uh, usually in a specialized metal layer uh, that is kept just for creating pin pads. Um, usually on the periphery of the, of the chip, if we are dealing with a chip with uh, pins on the periphery or on the top of the chip, if you are dealing with, uh, uh, you know, BGA or PGA chips. So the pad is large because it needs to provide a low resistance connection to the outside world. And it needs to provide a mechanically accessible connection through which we can solder the wires connecting the pad to the pin. Now, the question is, how is the signal moved from the pad to the uh, inside of the chip, to the main part of the chip, and how is the signal moved out? This is done through a pad interface circuit, which is a CMOS circuit, a, a collection of CMOS circuits that perform the, the four tasks we just talked about. This is surrounded by a guard ring. This guard ring is diffusion, and it's the opposite type of diffusion from the substrate in which it is uh, created. And uh, we provide reverse bias for this uh, diffusion layer so that we create a uh, thick um, depletion region around the pad interface circuit. This isolates the pad interface circuit from the pin pad and from the core of the circuit. Uh, 
and uh, this pr protects both the core of the circuit from the pad and the pad from the core of the circuit. We're worried about the interface circuit and the core uh, because they might be affected by the very large swings seen in the pad. And we are worried about um, the other way around because signals within the core of the, of the, of the chip change at a very high frequency and so they can couple even though they are low freak, low amplitude, they can couple some noise onto the signals going uh, out of the chip through the pin pad. Now, notice that we provide uh, the uh, connection to uh, reverse bias through as many contacts as we can provide between the metal lines and uh, the uh, guard ring. This is done to reduce the resistance of this contact as much as possible which helps reduce the chance of latch up. And we're particularly worried about latch up in, uh, in pins, uh, in pin pads, because of the large current that they carry, which can lead to large supply and ground bounces or drops, to be specific, leading to latch up. So we also talked about how in output pins, we have to provide a drive for the off-chip capacitance. So if you look at the PCB, the uh, transmitter chip has to drive the capacitance of this copper track. And this copper track is very wide. And we need it to be wide because we need it to be low resistance. Uh, it's so wide that you can easily see it with your eyes, with your you know naked eyes. So because it's wide, it has a large capacitance. And therefore, it needs a very large CMOS buffer driver to drive it. And so we need um, a, uh, a buffer chain at the output providing drive for this and we can optimize this buffer chain using um, logical effort methods so that the input capacitance of the first inverter in the buffer chain is um, on the same in the same range as the uh, sizes of gates within the chip itself and then the final buffer is really large and capable of driving this off chip capacitance we will need very large transistors in these final buffers and large transistors have a very large width uh, and so to create efficient layouts for uh, high W over L transistors we create them using this finger approach and so uh, you have multiple metal fingers extending into the fusion layers and multiple polysilicon fingers extending also into the diffusion layer um, What's happening here is that we are actually creating many, many parallel transistors. Uh, and so because they are parallel, they act as a single transistor because they share the same gate. So uh, it's a single transistor with an effective uh, W over L, which is the summation of uh, all of these transistors. So that helps you create a transistor with an effective aspect ratio that is really large but at the same time, an aspect ratio of the drawn layout, which is reasonable. Now, we also talked about ESD protection. ESD protection has to do with input pins uh, specifically. And the problem here is that imagine that this is the first um, CMOS gate that you see after you uh, cross the pin pad, right? And assume that this first MOSFET uh, CMOS gate is connected directly to the input pin. Now, input pins tend, and output pins, they tend to collect a lot of static charge. Uh, this could be just from the environment, but usually from humans. Uh, if we put a lot of charge on the on the input pin, it's static charge, you know, so it, it shouldn't be uh, a big deal, but it is because the pin itself is big, so it collects a lot of static charge, and this static charge gets distributed to the gates of these two MOSFETs. Remember that these are polysilicon gates uh, in a CMOS process, in a high uh, technology CMOS process, where the oxide below the polysilicon is really thin. And so these static charges are usually more than enough to create such a high electric field over the uh, gate oxide that it causes it to break down. And if these guys break down, that's irreversible and the whole chip is now, you know, useless just because the first gates have been burnt off. And so we have to provide circuits that, that just can drain away this uh, 
uh, static charge, and this is the ESD or electrostatic charge protection circuit, and it's part of the pad interface circuitry of input pins. Uh, ESD protection is provided by these two diodes, right? The resistance R plays an important role, which we'll discuss uh, shortly. But what, what's happening here is if the input pin is providing a uh, voltage, which is reasonable, and reasonable means the expected voltage for off-chip communication, then both of these diodes will be uh, reverse biased because uh, D1 sees a value on the anode that is smaller than the value on the cathode because its cathode is uh, connected to high supply voltage, whereas the anode of D2 is connected to a low voltage. And so normally these two diodes are doing nothing and the signal is just going to the uh, first gate in the chip and is being communicated as a signal. But if enough electrostatic charge gathers here that it creates a high enough voltage to break down the MOSFET gates, then the chip is done. But if we guarantee that the voltage at which these gates break down is smaller than the voltage at which D1 turns on, because D1 turns on when its anode is at um, basically VDD plus V gamma. So then D1 will start to conduct more or less as soon as the voltage on this node rises above supply voltage. And so it will provide a very low impedance path and it will start to drain the static charge instead of allowing the charge to build up so high that it breaks down MOSFET gates. Uh, D2 is providing uh, a safe passage for the uh, case where we collect a lot of negative charges on, on the input pin, in which case then the current will flow in this direction. The resistance R is a passive resistance, and it's an, a, very, a very important resistance. The role that it plays is that it limits the current that's flowing when we are discharging electrostatic uh, charge. Because without R, we are depending on the on resistance of the diodes D1 and D2, and that resistance is very small. And so you will see a very large current flowing, and that current itself could really overheat the pins. And so we need to use a passive resistance to limit this current. And this passive resistance is usually created in the polysilicon or the fusion layers. And it's created using a serpentine layout as shown here. Uh, this increases the effective length of the resistance and thus its value while compacting the overall layout. The last task that a pin uh, interface circuit has to provide is level conversion. So level conversion, again, would work for input pins and for output pins. Because for input pins, we need to move from high supply voltages to low supply voltages, where the high supply voltages are used for off-chip communication and the low supply voltages are used for on-chip communication. Vice versa happens in output pins. This is one circuit which allows us to perform level conversion. So we are converting from a supply voltage of VDD1 to a supply voltage of VDD2. We can also convert the grounds of these two signals, but usually ground is common for both on-chip and off-chip signals. So notice that this static inverter is using a supply of VDD1, while the circuit surrounding it is using a supply of VDD2, and these are the two values from between which we are converting. Uh, we could also be using a different ground for this supply for this inverter from the grounds used here. Again, that's not usually the case, but we could do that, and in which case we will convert between two uh, between two different ground levels. So inputs at point A are going to be between zero volt and VDD one, whereas inputs at point Y, which is the output from this level conversion circuit, are going to vary between zero volt and VDD two. Again, these two zero volts could be different values ostensibly, although we're just going to demonstrate the case where the one level differs. So let's assume that A is equal to zero volt. In that case, uh, M1 is off. And uh, the static inverter has a zero volt input, which allows it to produce a value of VDD1 at the input of M2. This input of VDD1 is enough to turn M2 on, which leads to a value at Y equal to zero volt because M2 is going to discharge the, the node Y. Now, let's assume that A is equal to VDD1 
in this case, the uh, static inverter is going to produce a value of 0 volt at B. So B is equal to 0 volt. This turns M2 off. And therefore, the value of Y cannot be determined from M2. However, because M1 is on, X is equal to 0 volt. Right? So X is equal to 0 volt. This turns M4 on. And because M4 is a PMOS, it manages to pass a value of VDD2 to Y. So we have converted between VDD1 and VDD2. Which of the two values is higher depends on whether we are moving uh, through an input pin or through an output pin.